You are now listening to the Supply Chain Secrets Podcast with Brian Most and Don Davis. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Brian Most, SVP of Retail Strategy at NYSHEX and former VP of Supply Chain at Walmart. And I'm Don Davis. I'm the Senior Vice President of Carrier Strategy here at NYSHEX and former executive of CMACGM and Hapag Lloyd. And we're back again with our podcast called Supply Chain Secrets. Don and I are very excited to announce we have a special guest on the show today. He's Mr. Gordon Downs, the CEO of the New York Shipping Exchange. And for those of you that haven't figured it out yet, Mr. Gordon is our boss. So, Don, uh, we we definitely better be careful with this discussion today. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so many of you have, have heard uh, Don and I work for, for the New York Shipping Exchange, and it's a digital platform that uh, connects shippers and their ocean carrier partners to provide contract reliability to both parties. And Gordon, we're so happy to have you on the podcast with us today. It's great to be here. I'm a huge fan of the show, so I'm, I'm honored to be part of it. Thanks for having me. Well, good. Thanks for that reinforcement. That's that's uh, that's good to hear from uh, from your boss. But uh, but Gordon, hey, it'd be great. Uh, I know many people know you in the industry, but it'd be great for our listeners if you could just share a bit about your background and uh, and how you got to uh, how you got to Nyshex. Sure, happy to share my background and the story of how we got to Nyshex. But so first off, I should say I'm from South Africa, hence the strange accent. And right after university, I graduated in 2000. I uh, joined Maersk as part of their management training program and spent 12 years in total with Maersk and had the opportunity to live in Japan and Denmark and then ultimately ended up here in the United States. And throughout my time in Maersk, it was, I spent a lot of uh, the, the rotations that I had or the roles that I had in either commercial or strategy roles. And most of those commercial roles were in trade management or back in the day, or line management. And there I was responsible for making decisions around the P&L, how many vessels we should deploy on a specific route, um, what prices to charge, what customers to prioritize, the cargo mix, et cetera. And it was a really great job. But one of the big challenges with that role is we would oftentimes sign contracts with customers. And uh, based on those contracts, we would plan the network and, and anticipate that the cargo would show up. And then a lot of the time, the cargo wouldn't show up. And of course, created a lot of problems because you're the cost of running the vessels, you know, it's, it's fixed and essentially the product perishes if you don't load the cargo on it. And um, it was a very frustrating thing to have to deal with situations where you had contract cargo, you held space on the ships and and then the cargo didn't materialize and that space on the vessel was essentially wasted. So that's part of the impetus for how we started NYSHEX. But what was really interesting is that I also spent three years at SAB Miller, the big beer company. It was a great company and, and is now part of the AB InBev uh, group, a, a, the leading global brewing company in the world. And um, at the time, it was when I should I should say when I joined them, I always assumed that the way in which contracts aren't really um, honored in the container shipping industry was a negative for the carriers, but perhaps a positive for the shippers. But what I realized when I was at SAB Miller is actually this is a double-edged sword and it cuts both ways. And, and many times this is a big negative for shippers. And in a nutshell, once I realized both the carrier and the shipper has a negative impact from the way that these contracts are not, not honored, uh, that's what gave me the confidence to, to partner up with some of my other friends and, and co-workers back at Maersk and, and start NYSHEX. So that's the, the origins of the, the company, as it were. Well, that's great. Well, uh, you know, I think that the amazing thing is, is that for those of us that have been in the business and the industry for a while have have seen the challenges you talk about, you know, happen day in, day out, year in, year out. And it's just one of those where it seems that uh, it becomes somewhat acceptable, you know, the inefficiency that's kind of built into the process. Have you just always had an entrepreneurial spirit or, you know, a a risk-taking part of you. I mean, what what it, what what causes you to finally say, "Hey, I'm going to gather up some of my friends, and we're actually going to try and go out and solve this." Yeah. So I'm not sure that I have a a real high risk tolerance or an entrepreneurial spirit. And you know, perhaps I do. I suppose I definitely do now that I'm doing this. But it's not something that was obvious to me before. But you know, what really gave me the conviction is that. When I was sitting in a trade manager role at Merth, this problem was so prominent and so impactful, i.e. negative, that it, it was frustrating and it really it, it was annoying. And then when I was at SAB Miller and I could see the problem from the other side of the table, it was also annoying. And then 
What was even more frustrating is that no one was really doing anything to solve the problem. And the way I rationalized you know, taking the leap and leaving a very good job with you know, five cases of free beer a month to work on a startup with no free beer and you know, no certainty of the paycheck um, was the fact that if, if I didn't do it and you know, perhaps someone else did it, I would regret it for the rest of my life. And I thought that this is an opportunity to do something that could have a real impact, make a difference and really benefit everyone, shippers and carriers and NBOCCs. And um, so if, if I see the opportunity, then I should take advantage. Well, not necessarily take advantage, but I should have responsibility for fulfilling that need. So that's kind of what motivated me to do it. And it uh, wasn't, wasn't always that easy to tell my wife because, you know, with the time we had a young daughter who was three years old and the, I kid you not, the month I started working at NYSHEX, my wife told me she was pregnant with our second child. So I really had to repeat that message back to myself that if I don't, if I don't do this, I'm going to regret it much more later in life. And I think it's, it's true. So anyway, that's the, that's the reality of how it all came to be. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Um, so now at this point, you're, you're at a stage where you've left the corporate world, you started in the startup world, and now you've been on that journey for a while. Looking back, what would you say the biggest differences are between that corporate life and now being part of a startup? Yeah, the differences are massive. And, and so I don't know how you gentlemen feel, but the way I feel is nothing anyone could have told me before I left the corporate world to join the startup world would have prepared me for the startup world. I mean, the, the differences are enormous. Um, first of all, on the positives, it's absolutely invigorating it's wonderful to come to work and to know that you know we're doing something very meaningful and the, the decisions we make every day the work we do every day has a definitive impact versus a lot of times in a corporate like role unless you're sort of really high up at the top of the company you're somewhat of a cog in a machine and the machine is well oiled and you know if you don't perform that well like you know machine's not really going to notice immediately and if you work extremely hard it's not going to have a massive impact on the the outcome of the big corporate but in our world that's absolutely the opposite we have a huge impact based on how hard we work how good we how good the decisions are that we make so that impact was invigorating um the other thing which is i think really invigorating about working in a startup is the the culture the team the dynamics of you know almost taking this massive risk with a group of people that you suddenly get like you feel like you're married to like it's a it's a real sort of family like culture and that we're all in this together and we all either you know thrive or perish together in terms of the you know the company and um so that creates some really great bonds that go beyond just you know having a relationship with a colleague you you feel almost like as if you're in battle with uh, with sort of other soldiers or something like that to use an analogy and I really thrive on that. I love the team culture that we have. And, and that really motivates me. If I'm having a tough day, I sort of look at some of the other people in the company and kind of it gives me strength to, to sort of to press on. And hopefully that's you know true for everyone else in the company. So you know those are things which I absolutely love about the company. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is that you know when I um, worked at, in, in corporate, you get to a Friday afternoon, you have a tough week or what have you, you sort of log off for the weekend, you go home and you don't have to worry so much about what's happening at the office. You'll get back on Monday and kind of pick up where you left off. Whereas, you know, I think, you know, we're under such a, a high pressure environment to constantly be moving forward, constantly be innovating, et cetera, that there's no downtime. I find myself, you know, I'll be bathing my kids at night and, you know, I'm still thinking through how we're going to solve this next set of problems. And you never unplug in the way that you would in the, in a corporate world. So, you know, that, Pros and cons, but overall, I'm delighted to be in in this company, and I think that the uh, the culture we have here is amazing. And I uh, I certainly wouldn't want to go back to the traditional corporate culture. I think that would, especially after having experienced this, would be very hard to get used to the old ways of working. Yeah, I think that's great, and I can certainly relate. And I I'm sure Brian can too. I'd love to hear his comments. But just from my perspective, I think you're dead right with what you said. And I think initially, because I think Brian and I are relatively new. Um, out of the three of us, I'm the newest one, but not by much, Brian. Um, but you, 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 it is a little outside your comfort zone, right? That that you're you're in a in a corporate world, everything's kind of running. But again, you, you as you say, you're sort of a cog in a machine that that it works. And if you weren't there, like some people take these long vacations, and and you know everything keeps running, that the 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 business doesn't stop. Where 
here at NYSHEX, I mean, there's a lot more uh, impact I think people make. And but I think that's part of the thrill and the fun is that you see the impact you're making. You see the effect of decisions you make. And in a lot of ways, I mean, it does kind of like take over your downtime in your brain. But that's always fun because I can relate to every weekend I come back to work on Monday and I'm like, oh, I had this or that idea that I'm going to try and implement this week. So you think about it, but I think that's part of the fun. And uh, Brian, I'd love to hear your comments too on this topic. Yeah, I think Gordon's term invigorating is is really one that describes it for me. Um, you know, being part of a big corporate culture, uh, certainly you have the ability to have a large responsibility or lead a large amount of people. But a lot of times it's a very narrow scope in terms of responsible for one aspect of the business or of the supply chain. Uh, one of the things that Gordon told me from the very beginning was, is that, you know, that I'd have the ability to participate in, in all areas of the business, you know, helping, you know, grow our, our culture and our recruiting effort and, you know, all different aspects of, of the company be able to have a say and a perspective. And that's really been fun for me. Uh, one, personally, there's been a lot of personal growth and learning. Um, but two, to be creative and not be bound by existing um, operating procedures or guidelines or a rule book. Uh, of course, there are some uh, and there's a great foundation there. But this ability to be creative and expand and to align um, culture, services, offerings with, you know, true member and market need has just been so much fun and creative. And so, uh, so yeah, I, I definitely appreciate my time at, with, with the corporate culture. Um, but as Gordon said, it, it'd certainly be hard to, hard to go back at, at this point. You know, but Gordon, one of the things I wanted to pick on that, pick up on that you said earlier was this idea around NYSHEX kind of helping or engaging um, kind of all stakeholders. Uh, a lot of times in, in this business or a lot of businesses where there are contracts and negotiations, it's almost a zero sum game. Somebody wins, somebody loses. Um, and then the one that loses, you know, walks away saying, you know, I'll, I'll get you next year kind of thing. And I just wonder, you know, your perspective, when, when we talk about NYSHIC, yes, we can fulfill a need around digital contracting and, you know, performance-based, you know, contracts and supply chain, but this void uh, around bringing kind of all stakeholders together around, you know, kind of common themes or common goals and objectives around collaboration and transparency how do you see NYSHEX fulfilling kind of that need that seems like there's a void right now in, in the marketplace? Yeah, that that's such an interesting question. And, you know, to be honest, for me, what's really exciting is working in a world where you're trying to create value as opposed to just take value from one person's pocket and put it in another person's pocket, i.e. like a zero-sum game. Um, and I think what we do at NYSHEX really is a win-win because the way the industry operates today causes waste that everyone suffers from. You know, for instance, carriers, when they're sending vessels across the oceans with cargo that is not on board, but should have been on board according to the contract or the booking, that value of the space on the ship is wasted. And when a shipper is supposed to have goods in inventory and um, in order to make a sale and that um, inventory is stuck in on the other side of the Pacific Ocean, they lose a sale that creates waste. Um, or when a shipper builds up huge amounts of inventory to deal with volatility or uncertainty in their supply chain, that creates waste. So there's all this waste that builds up in the network. Um, coincidentally, like that, that all ultimately cascades down to the, the cost of the goods that get paid by the consumer, whether the carrier is experiencing waste and passing that along in cost, or it's just everyone absorbs the weight of the waste, so to speak. And what's great about what we're doing here is just really playing a very important role enabling carriers and shippers to be able to squeeze that waste out of their networks or out of their supply chains. And by squeezing out that waste, you're creating value. And so instead of just moving you know, a few dollars from one person's pocket to the next, you're actually helping you know, everyone get a better outcome whereby carriers can optimize their vessels more and shippers can optimize their supply chains more, give a better service to the end customer, carriers can better service the shippers. And of course, when I say shippers, I mean, BCOs and NBOs. But um, so that for me is a very you know, exciting opportunity to create value versus just shift value. And you know, when I think about how we play this role, you know, it's really a role of building a, uh, a change or like a transformation in the old way of working and helping people see value in a new way of working, um, whereby I think today the legacy process is very much a vicious cycle. You know, 
carriers, you said it, Brian, they, they'll squeeze the shipper for the highest possible price when they have leverage. And of course, when the table turns, the shipper will squeeze their carrier for the lowest possible price. And um, there's a lot of incentive for a shipper to walk away from a contract if the price from the next best competitor or competing carrier goes down and vice versa for a carrier to walk away from a shipper when another shipper is prepared to pay a higher price. And you know all of those uh, incentives just perpetuate this vicious cycle. And what we're able to do is by creating integrity in these contracts and very importantly, building a structure, building a technology, building a process and everything that supports the, the contracts with more integrity, it breaks that vicious cycle and creates, a, I think, a much more virtuous cycle that reinforces um, repeating the positive processes, like being a shipper of choice or a carrier of choice because you're able to deliver more on those commitments. And the reason you can deliver more on those commitments is because the carriers are able to uh, fulfill the contracts that they have and bring the cargo into the terminal when it's needed, et cetera. I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful, virtuous cycle. And I think what we're doing is, again, playing that role in terms of helping to create a structure, build technology, et cetera, that transforms the process. So I think it's very exciting. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's exciting. And, you know, one might listen to this and say, OK, you know, that sounds very academic and and, you know, might have some doubt. But I think what what would be interesting for our listeners is to talk a little bit about the performance of the company. We're halfway here through 2021. How's the company been performing and and what's your short term outlook for the company, given what we've seen so far this year? Yeah, um, I think that's a great point. I mean, theory is one thing, but the application of the theory is always um, it's a different ball game. And, and the good thing is this: the way that this is playing out is really resonating, and we can see it in the numbers. So, you know, just to share some numbers, you know, last year we contracted a total of 200,000 TUs. Coincidentally, that was three times what it was the year before. And and the fact that it's growing at that rate really demonstrates that you know, people are seeing value in it. And and this year we're on track to grow, you know, four x what we did. Uh, last year. So that sort of almost that exponential growth demonstrates that both carriers and shippers, and I should always say NBOCCs as well, see the value and they are adopting the new way of working, the technology, et cetera. And that, that's a proof point. But even more important than the, the growth or the adoption and the number of contracts is the compliance rates of the contracts. So, you know, last year, for instance, depending on the data source, the, the contract compliance rate was, I think if you're generous, about 63, 64%. When we look at the contract compliance rates for the shippers, those 200,000 TUs that was contracted on NYSHEX, it's 99%. So to my mind, that really demonstrates that it works. And you know, another sort of factor, which I think is also very important to, to keep in mind, is that it's quite tough for a shipper to change their legacy processes and get on board with NYSHEX where there's a need for security and there's more structure and rigor in the process, et cetera. You know, it takes a fair bit of effort. But what's good about the, the journey that we see shippers go through is once they join the exchange, they make the first contract on the exchange, uh, the retention rate is well over 90%. In fact, it's if you look at a, it's at a weighted retention rate, it's like close to 99%. So it's a really proving or well, it's a really promising data point to show that once a shipper embraces this or once a carry on NBOCC embraces that it really works and it becomes quite valuable and sticky and then they tend to sort of renew those contracts going forward. So Gordon it's great to see right this adoption and this evolution uh, certainly through the metrics and the financials but there there must have been some evolution also with the product and the offering itself. The company being five plus years uh, in uh, in existence now and starting with something that was probably smaller and more transactional or point to point in nature and has grown to something that's much more strategic in nature and aligns more with kind of the procurement efforts of, of large, you know, shippers. Uh, can you just talk about that evolution and, and how it, how it came to be? Yeah, that that's, it's such an interesting story. Um, so, just dating back to when we launched the company back in 2015, the, the mission that we were on was always to enable more reliable shipping through effective digital contracts. That's always been the sort of guiding principle. But our first product was quite interesting because it's not the product we have today. Um, the way that it worked was a carrier would advertise to shippers or offer shippers um, specific rates for specific services on specific port pairs for a specific week 
that a shupa could then accept. Once the shipper accepted that, then it was a binding contract. Um, and these contracts were, you know, very transactional, very tactical. You know, the price would vary one week to the next or one port to the next. And, and there was uh, quite a lot of complexity in that. The reason why we, we did that was because at the time, um, there were no sort of most spot products. There was you know, the, the way that a shipper and a carrier would typically agree on a price would be, you know, an email exchange or a telephone exchange. And so we thought that we needed to build technology so that the shipper could see exactly what the carrier was offering. So there's no dispute further down the stream as to, you know, was it 10 containers or 12 containers? Or was it week 10 or was it week 11? Or, you know, was it price X or was it Y? So that's why we built the system the way it was. And we got some, I think, quite healthy growth from that in the early days of the company. But um, what happened in 2019, one of our um, sort of big shippers, actually uh, April Zobel from the, the Andersons, came to us and said, we really enjoy using NYSHEX because once we make a NYSHEX contract, we know that the equipment's going to be available. We know we get the space on the ship. We know that the price is what we agree to. All of these things are great. However, it's quite complicated because every single week we've got to log back into the system and see how much space the carrier is willing to offer from each origin destination. The price varies dynamically based on movements in the market, et cetera. Um, and that's quite a lot of work. And is there a way in which we could potentially agree on some terms with the carrier. We make it nice and clear, so it's similar to the structure that we have at the moment, except the contract would be valid for more than one week, you know, maybe it'd be valid for a, a month or a quarter. So that was in April 2019, and we tested that out together with Merskline, and it was a great success. I think that we really isolated the value that NYSHEX provided, because it's not about the, you know, helping shippers and carriers to match supply and demand. That's never been the value that NYSHEX was intended to offer. Like I said, our mission was all about making shipping more reliable through more effective contracts. And so since then, we've seen the adoption of these contracts that the, the terms are agreed to directly between the carrier and the shipper, but it uses the NYSHEX framework where the contracts are crystal clear yet customizable. And then the downstream process is exactly the same as it was in the first version of the product, i.e. we're being able to integrate into the carrier system and keep track of every single booking and every single shipping shipment to map back to the contract. Now, that works really well. So we've seen some great growth over that. And now 100% of all the contracts on NYSHEX are done through this new product innovation. So I think that goes back to being able to listen to what our members are telling us, where they see the value, and also focusing on fulfilling the mission versus just being married to the product in its own right. I think that really is what allowed us to innovate and, and to build something that's you know, seeming to be getting a lot of value in the hands of our members. Yeah, that's great. And I love to hear that story of how things evolve with NYSHEX because I remember when I was on the board at NYSHEX with, with Hapag Lloyd, things looked a lot different. And then it, it's really cool to see how that evolved over time. So from that perspective, is there anything that you can share with our listeners is that's that's coming up, that's in the in the new, near term? Is there anything in the future that you've seen that you, you can share with our listeners that that's exciting for you as, as we evolve and, and grow further? Yes, there's there's so many um, interesting, I would say, opportunities for us to improve the product or the value that we offer to our, our members. And we get a lot of really great ideas from our members. And we love it when that comes through. And so um, it's always like invigorating to, to get that feedback. I'd say there's, there's a, two things that really um, sort of make me excited about what opportunities are right in front of us. You know, one is we're starting to work with um, our sort of bigger accounts, um, like our enterprise accounts. These could be you know, bigger bigger shippers, bigger retailers, could be also some big NBOCCs. And we're starting to find ways that we can take our technology and integrate more of their data to provide them more insight into what's actually happening with their contracts and to streamline some of those downstream workflows so that there's less manual resources involved on their end to keep track of the contract compliance and um, to sort of follow through when things, when exceptions come about. So, you know, those integrations with these sort of enterprise accounts are really exciting. And we've got some absolutely phenomenal members who take a lot of time with us to help us understand what they need and the various different use cases. And, you know, we're just absolutely delighted to be able to build out those products to meet their needs. So that's one. The other area I'm really excited about is payments um, and being able to smooth over the process of collecting the security deposits and managing the uh, 
the invoice reconciliation, the freight invoice reconciliation and streamline the payment processes. This is something we're in the very early stages of, of delving into, but you know, I can share with you that we've been piloting with a few very innovative shippers and carriers on the exchange and the results are super compelling. And I think the more we can innovate around that and make the process for a carrier and for a shipper, and of course for always an ABOCC, to be much more streamlined, the easier it is for people to use it and the more compelling it becomes. So you know, this, those are just two, and there's many others as well that, that I'm sure over time we'll be able to um, explore and, and to be able to announce. But right now I'm, I'm very excited about those two. You know, Gordon, those are, are super exciting things. And again, the, the neat part about it is, is, is so much of that is, is member driven, um, whether it be, you know, from carriers who, who want to innovate or shippers who want to innovate. And uh, again, you know, you're solving real problems because these are, are the people who are using your solutions and products every day and saying, this is great, but if I could only have this, it would be that much better and, uh, and help solve their problems. And make them more efficient and allow them to be much more effective in their business with, with their customers. And, you know, I just, I just wonder, you know, even beyond that, and, and these are hard questions to answer, but you know, when you think later down the line, um, you know, it's kind of neat now that, you know, when people in the marketplace are talking about a committed or performance based deal, they talk about it like a nice deal, which is kind of cool. I mean, you know, what, what ultimately would you like the, the mark, you know, the, the company that you started and, you know, you know, when you think down the line, if, if Nyshix could leave a mark on the industry or, or some, some, some part of a legacy, what would you be proud of? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a real tough question. Um, but, you know, I think that we're in a very unique place as Nyshix in that there's a lot of trust that's bestowed on us. Um, you know, carriers and shippers and MBOCCs trust us to independently gather all the data from each of their contracts and then make a determination as to who's at fault. And, um, you know, that's that's a very important role that we play and the, the trust that we that is bestowed on us in that role is, is key. Um, I think that the regulators trust us to be very deliberate about the way that the exchange is governed and the rules and everything else. And, so I think that trust is is really um, is key. And what what I would love to see, and I would feel very proud of, is that Nyshix really is um, like an enduring company that brings trust, both by virtue of the governance and the, the good sort of the good name of the company and the fact that we've served our members really well. Um, but the trust that we have created then allows carriers and shippers and MBOCCs, etc., to really trust each other. Yeah, that's awesome. And and I think that, at least from my perspective, we're on our, we're well on our way there. I think we're off to a great start. Um, and I think the whole journey that, that Nyshix has been on is incredible. But if, if let's just say you could take the current version of yourself and you could go back in time to when the company first started and you could give yourself some advice or tell yourself something, is there anything that comes to mind that you would say to yourself from, with the perspective that you have today that, that you didn't know at that time? Oh, yeah. I think I would definitely warn myself that it's not going to be as easy as you think. Um, I think when, I don't know if this is true for all entrepreneurs or first time entrepreneurs, but certainly in my case, like I had no idea how tough some of the challenges would be that we need to overcome. Um, but, you know, perhaps in a way it's, it's a good thing that I, I'm not able to go back in time and warn myself because maybe I would have decided to just stick with the, the really great beer job with my five free cases of beer. But um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's tough. There's constant challenges and you got to be ready to, to sort of work through the nights or through the weekends if that's what's required to get through it. But, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, like I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, that's awesome. So Gordon, uh, I think at this point, the company has been doing great. It's, it's awesome to see how the company is evolving and it's, it, we're really growing. We're, we're expanding there. We're adding a lot of people. Uh, can you talk a little bit what it's like to work at NYSHEX? Like what, what makes it cool to be part of NYSHEX? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that I think make it cool. I mean, I think we've got a great culture. The, the, the people that have been here for some time, especially like really do like sort of exude the, this great collaborative culture. So if I were to just describe the culture a little bit, I would say that you know, everyone who's here really has bought into the vision and mission and is excited to make an impact. Um, I don't think there's anyone in the company that just wants to come to work every day, clock in at five and leave it, well, clock in at nine and leave at five. I think it's not about the hours, it's about the impacts, about how much you can get done and, and how like 
how you can actually leave a dent on the industry and and so on. So that for me is is really exciting. And what's also really nice about the the culture is it's not a competitive culture whereby people compete with each other. We're very competitive with being able to hit our goals, but we compete as a team. Um, and part of what allows us to compete so well as a team is this you know, really collaborative way of working where um, everyone is just focused on like achieving the, the broader company objectives. There's a, we have some structures in terms of you know who people report into and you know what job descriptions might say, but really those are just guidelines and people are absolutely empowered to do what they think is the right thing to do and to work together with one another to get you know move the company forward overcome the next set of challenges and you know establish the next milestones and so on so i would say that um it's it's all about impact and that's really cool and it's all about being competitive and creating value for our members and everything else but doing it in a way which is very collaborative and working together and using structure as guidelines versus you know following the book so to speak so i think that's kind of cool what do you guys think i mean you know brian how would you describe the culture in ishex yeah I, I tell you what it has been so much fun um being part of of a startup um you know technology type of company something completely different than what i had experienced the majority of my career you know, uh, a lot of people know that I work both for a carrier and on, on the shipper side of the business, and both were bigger, mature, market-leading companies, which was, was fantastic. Um, but I tell you what, being part of a very quick-moving, um, you know, culture uh, that is kind of mission and driven purpose uh, has really hit a sweet spot for me uh, because it has allowed me, it's allowing me to personally and professionally grow in ways and in areas that I just couldn't or didn't previously in, in my career at, at, at bigger companies. And so that has been just really uh, fulfilling for me. And to do that, as you said, with a collaborative group of, of people that um, I respect and trust. You, you talked about trust earlier, wanting Nyshix to be a trusted voice or a name in the industry and a lot of us have worked really hard to try and create a reputation for ourselves so it's really important to be aligned with other people and an organization where trust and transparency and collaboration are are important and so that has just been so much fun for me and just the diversity in the team that we have so diversity of thought opinion background um, because this is a technology and product driven company, yes, we're serving the, the ocean market and the supply chain industry, but we've got people from all types of backgrounds. So um, somebody like me or Don who have done something for so many years, sometimes you get stuck in your ways and to, to be challenged in a way um, that, uh, that is, is positive. Um, to think differently and act differently has just been fantastic. And so this environment that's created where, you know, we, we have healthy debate and we challenge each other in a positive way. We decide, but then collectively move forward as a group and have done some really amazing things. So I tell you what, um, I've really just been, um, been excited. And, and then the other, the last point is just, you know, so focused on, on members and customers, right? I mean, all the things we're doing are to, to make members and customers and the industry's life better and more efficient. And, uh, and I'll tell you what, you know, that, that kind of hits all the marks for me. So, uh, I've had, I've had a ton of fun so far. It's brilliant. Great to hear. What about you, Don? Yeah. I mean, it's been a great journey so far. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, a lot of what's driving that is first of all, I, I like the fact that I'm learning a lot. I think being exposed to like the product team and thinking about how you develop a product, how you try and solve problems, and that becomes the focus of what you're doing and how you go about solving problems is really getting that member feedback is, is really interesting. And the process that that we go through to develop that is is super cool. Um, there's not politics at the company. I mean, as, as we've already talked about, we're all trying to move in the same direction. There's healthy debate which I love because I've always felt like if you can't defend your position, then it might be a weak position, right? So, so let's talk about it. Let's talk, let's try and understand the perspective. And I think it's a great way to move forward. It's a great culture, but it also keeps us all moving in the same direction. And if we, if we have an issue, let's talk about it. And there's such an agility and speed that we make decisions and do things. I think, I can relate to, you know, just the carrier side. And sometimes it feels like you're trying to like 
knock the earth off its axis to try and like change something. It's like very difficult to do. And, and, and on a carrier side, I would say that a lot of things that are done or not a lot of things, some things that are done feel like meaningless tasks. Like you put all this information to a CRM and no one ever looks at it, or you fill out these spreadsheets. No one ever uses that. And in our world, there's not a lot of waste. Like we're very efficient at what we do and in all everything we're doing is to a higher purpose. And that is to build a better product for our members and to deliver a service that is second to none. So I, I think for me, it's been just such a great journey and, and I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to come to work every day and it's a great team and a great culture. And just for me personally, it's been great. Well, and the fact, Gordon, that you let two guys like us even start a podcast. I mean, I think that's just something <laughs> really cool, right? Within the company, but it really, it started as just this great debate and discussion that says, Hey, maybe we should record this discussion for future team members or people that weren't part of this meeting to, Hey, you know, maybe the, the broader group or the industry could benefit or our members could benefit from things like this. So things like we've done webinars and podcasts, the feedback has been so positive, but these are things that, you know, basically move from concept to, to, to putting in place in, in, you know, a matter of days or weeks. And I think that just is a really fun culture and environment to be in. And obviously there are some things that work and don't, but we learn along the way and we adjust and we move forward. And like I said, that's, that's just been a lot of fun for me. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, everything you said really resonates. So that's excellent. Cool. Great stuff. Yeah, great. Well, thanks a lot, Gordon. Thanks a lot for coming on our show. I think it was a great show. I hope our listeners really liked it. Uh, it was fun for us to chat with you and hear that origin story. So that that was awesome stuff. Cool. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. And for our listeners, don't forget, uh, if you listen to the show, hit the like button. Go ahead and rate us five star ratings, please. And by the way, we're climbing the charts. We're number 104 in Israel. So Israel, thank you. We want to be number one. So let's keep pushing. But thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for listening to the Supply Chain Secrets Podcast. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast network.